After 13 years of running, Radovan Karadzic has now run into the hands of the UN War Crimes Tribunal, accused of genocide and war crimes. Has his capture stoked ultra-nationalism in Serbia? And what's his trial likely to reveal? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Imran Garda. Despite being one of the world's most wanted men, former Bosnian Serb leader Radovan Karadzic remains a national hero to many Serbs. Thousands turned out in Belgrade on Tuesday night to show their support for the war crime suspect. He's been in custody in the Serb capital since his capture last week. But as his extradition took place, those loyal to him poured onto the city streets to protest against the government decision to extradite him to the International Criminal Tribunal in The Hague. Joining us from The Hague is our correspondent Harry Smith who's been following the recent developments. Harry, what's the atmosphere like at The Hague given that Radovan Karadzic has finally arrived? Well, it was an arrival that uh, was greeted um, with uh, some sense of relief, I'm sure, by uh, those responsible for running the tribunal here. Uh, it's been a long time coming. We now know that uh, Radovan Karadzic will appear here in a court number one uh, at four o'clock on Thursday afternoon. For the first time, he will see court number one. It's a view he had better get used to. These trials do tend to take a long time. Of course, we don't yet know the dates for the trial. He will appear. First of all, uh, it's, it's a brief hearing. Uh, he will not be asked uh, whether or not uh, he is guilty or not guilty, and his lawyer has said uh, he will not uh, enter a plea at this stage. He has uh, 30 days to do that. Uh, if he fails to enter a plea after 30 days, then the judges will enter one on his behalf, and that will be a plea of not guilty. Well, uh, to tell me what happens from then on, I'm John from the tribunal uh, by Nerna Jelacic, who speaks for the tribunal. Uh, tell me, uh, how confident are you uh, that uh, this trial will go ahead, given the failure of previous trials? I'm thinking particularly uh, of Milosevic. Uh, I would say that uh, we are very confident that the trial will go ahead. The defendant is in our custody and the tribunal is ready to do everything in its power to ensure that his well-being as well as right to experience trial are um, uh, appreciated in accordance with the highest international standards. I would not say that we have had failures in previous trials. Out of 161 indictees of the tribunal, we only have two fugitives for 15 years of record. That is, I think, an impressive record. The Milosevic trial, though, was dogged, wasn't it, by delays, and partly due to his ill health, partly due to the fact that he was defending himself. We're told that uh, Radovan Karadzic will also defend himself. Is that going to make it possible uh, for, for the prosecutors to, uh, to, 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 to keep the trial on track? What I can say, and I speak on behalf of the tribunal, is that the tribunal's rights do safeguard the rights of every defendant to represent himself if it is in his interest. So it is the judges of this tribunal who will make the final decision. Uh, once the defendant, once Radovan Karadzic expresses his wishes, he is today in the detention unit, as you know. He is meeting representatives of the registry who are explaining to him all the rights that he has regarding also so legal aid and the, the help with conducting his own defense and in the courtrooms at four o'clock he is expected to also express his wish in terms of how he expects to conduct his trial but even then it is the judges who are going to make the final decision. Now as you say you have experience of many trials but this is really going to be an exceptional trial isn't it? Will he be treated any differently from any other detainee? He will not be treated uh, differently. He is arriving in front of this tribunal, in front of its judges, with a presumption of innocence like one would before any other court in a democratic country. So the burden is, let's remember, on the prosecution to prove the counts that it charges him with. Yes, the counts are very serious. Yes, they include genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, etc. This makes the charges very, very, very serious. And of course, that takes time to prove those charges, but the tribunal will do its best to, uh, and give all its powers possible to make sure that this trial is expeditious. Now, Mr. Vadic, thank you very much indeed for joining us, and uh, with that, I now uh, hand you back to the studio.
Harry Smith, thanks ever so much for that. Well, joining us as we broaden out this discussion today are our guests in Copenhagen, Payam Achavan. He was the first legal advisor to the prosecutor of the tribunal. He's also a professor of international law at McGill University in Belgrade. Vladimir Radomirovic, deputy editor of foreign affairs at the Serbian Daily Politica. And in Sarajevo, Nidjara Ahmetasevic. She's a journalist and editor of Justice Report at the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Payam Akhavan, if I could start off with you. This has been called a landmark for international justice. Is it? It is a landmark. Uh, if we go back to 1995, when we first indicted Radovan Karadzic, uh, uh, the, uh, he was seemingly invincible. People thought we were uh, utterly naive to think that he could ever uh, face justice one day. He was an indispensable partner in the peace process. Uh, and many uh, individuals, diplomats in the United Nations, actually suggested that indicting him was a bad idea because it would be an impediment to the peace process. And I think that the indictment succeeded in removing Radovan Karadzic from the political stage, making him a fugitive. That itself was a great success for international criminal justice, both because it helped the post-conflict peace-building process in Bosnia by removing and marginalizing ethnic hate mongers and those that, who were the architects of ethnic cleansing. It sent a message for the first time in the history of the United Nations that you cannot commit genocide with impunity. But of course the fact that he was still a fugitive and not arrested frustrated the international community and the tribunal. And I think that 13 years later, uh, the fact that he's arrested sends the message to other would-be tyrants that you can run, but you can't hide. You may be in power today, but tomorrow you will fall from grace. Uh, and I think in that respect, it is a landmark because the Yugoslav tribunal was the first experiment in international criminal justice since the World War II Nuremberg Tribunal. And the precedent that it sets is extremely important for the International Criminal Court and for the future of ending a, a culture of impunity that has prevailed for so long in the international community.